Hello. As we talk about a new subject that you really want to hear. But it must be talking about. We're going to do now, I don't know how many weeks. We've got two books, two parts, many things to talk about. We're going to talk about money. Oop, was that a sound of, of turning the thing off? The, the, the God of the love of money it has to be talked about. Now, let me stress to you, first of all, the most important part of this study. This study is to be used with the King James Version of the Bible. Otherwise, your answers are going to be incorrect. How's that? Money. <clears throat> Today, tithes, offerings, and alms. Tithes were practiced before the Old Testament law. Take your Bibles, Genesis 14, 18. <coughs> Excuse me, I got a little bit of a cough. Hope you don't want to fear. Genesis 14, 18. And this is long before Moses shows up. This is long before Exodus 20. <clears throat> In Genesis 14, 18, 14, 18, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest, the most high, God. According to Genesis 14, 18, Melchizedek was not only the king of Salem, but he was also the priest of the Most High God. Now, big deal. Oh, so what? Uh, verse 20. Big deal. And he, and blessed be the Most High God, which has delivered thy enemies into thy hand. And he, Abram, gave him tithes of all. Oh, so there is a tithe mentioned before the law. Note, a tithe, found in verse 20, is one-tenth of an amount. For every one dollar, it would require a dime. For every ten dollars, it would be a dollar. For every hundred dollars, the tithe would be ten dollars, etc. So what you would do is you would drop, as far as dollars, you would drop a zero. Abram paid tithes to the priest Melchizedek. As we saw what kind of priest he was in verse 18. He was of the most high God. So tithing was practiced by believers, Abram, long before giving of the law to Moses. So you can't say tithing is under the law. We have just made that comment void and noid. Nay, nada. This is not the lone incident. Oh, you know, just, just one time. You, you, oh, you want to see another time? You sure you won't go this? Okay. Genesis 28, 20. Genesis 28, 20. And as we read in Genesis 28, 20, And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat, and raiment to put on. So then I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God. Notice it says, The Lord be my God. Got that? Did you get that statement? The Lord be my God. Is the Lord your God? This stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. 
and of all that shall of, and all that thou shalt give me God's giving you things right and he's your God right yes I will surely give the tenth unto thee Jacob vowed the vow and part of it was and all that thou shalt give me I will surely give the tenth unto thee it is clear that tithing was not just a once in a while thing because Jacob vowed to tithe out of all what God has given him I asked you is God your God has God given you things it is clear that the principle of regular tithing was practiced by believers long before God gave the law concerning and commanding his people to do it. Jacob was a believer in God. Abram was a believer in God. There was no law set. Thou shalt not, you not shown up to Exodus 20. But yet, tithing is here. Abram tithed. Jacob vowed to tithe. Tithing was practiced before the Old Testament law. <clears throat> now, this is what you want to hear. This is what people say. Tithing was commanded under the law. This is what most people want. Deuteronomy 14.22, and we'll look at the places so we know where it is. We want you to know. We want you to have the truth. We want you to read the truth. Uh, the King James Bible, we don't think that, you know, I'm coming up with this. This is God. This is not me. I hate to, you know, have you think this is me and it's not me, but it's God. We read out of Genesis in black and white. Now we're in Deuteronomy 14.22. <clears throat> and this is under the law. Moses wrote Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is part of the law. The five books that Moses wrote. The Pentateuch. Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed that the field bringeth forth year by year. Well, look at that. It's not just money here. Seed. And for the seed, I mean, it would be barley, it would be wheat, it would be uh, anything planted. And you're just worried about money. Have you ever gave tithe of all the tomatoes or cucumbers you picked out of your garden? I'm supposed to do that? Well, that's under the law. Yeah, I know, isn't it? It's under the law, so it's safe, okay? You can Don't stop right now. Don't turn this off. Don't stop these lessons and say, Brother Hayward said that this is under the law, and I am I don't have to tithe, I don't have to give my tomatoes or anything. Don't you dare go say Brother Hayward said that, and you're going to stop right now because you'll be a liar because we've got plenty more to, to talk about. We've got, like I said, we've got two books. To go through. So if you stop right now and say that I said that tithing uh, tomatoes and my money is under the law, you are a liar. Because we're going to look at the church age soon. But let's go to another place. Let's go to the last book of the Old Testament in the King James Bible. Let's go to Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. The last book of your Bible just before Matthew. Still under the law. All right. When you get to Matthew, turn left. I guess I made notes in my Bible. All right. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. By the way, Malachi 
is written to the priest. Malachi 3, verse 8. And he's talking to the people now. <clears throat> and he says in Malachi 3, 8, Will a man rob God? You ever think about robbing God? You know, you go in there, you got your face covered with a bandana and with a gun. And stick him up, God. Give me all your blessings. Give me all your mercy, or I'll shoot you. Yet ye have robbed me. Wait a minute. It is recorded, will a man rob God? And you think, wow, that's weird. No. But God says, yet you have robbed me. How do you rob God? Malachi 3.8. Wherein have we robbed thee? That's the question. Did you ask that question? Say, how do I rob God? In tithes and offerings. Malachi 3, 8. You know, if you're a born-again Christian, I'm not talking to anybody who's lost. I'm talking to born-again Christians only. If you don't tithe, if you don't give offerings, the charge will be robbing God. Verse 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now where, uh, excuse me, prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. God speaking, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, that there shall be room enough to receive it. God saying, listen, listen, go ahead, give me your blessing, give me your tithes, give me your offerings, and I will return a blessing upon you. I will in turn bless you by you blessing me. I and mean, we talk about the blessings of God. Do you ever think about how you can bless God? God promises a blessing to those who would tithe, Malachi 3.10, and a curse to those who would not, Malachi 3.9. Read those chapters again, Malachi 3.8 to 3.10. <clears throat> Tithings or tithes were practiced before the Old Testament law. Tithes were commanded under the Old Testament law. Now, did you get that? Before the law, they were practiced. Under the law, they were commanded. Now, you say, okay, well, that leaves me out. Part C. Tithes are expected during the church age. Tithes were practiced before the Old Testament law. Tithes were commanded under the Old Testament law. Tithes are expected during the church age. I'm going to hit home. This is us. 1 Timothy 5.17. <clears throat> Timothy 5.17. First Timothy 5.17 states, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. The double honor is defined by referring to an Old Testament command in the next verse. Let's read that verse. Verse 18. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. And the laborer is worthy of his reward. In other words, when you got corn, when you got an ox stepping out of corn, don't muzzle him. Let him eat. He's worthy of that food. Double honor is defined by referring to an Old Testament command that the next verse about not muzzling the ox as he treads out the corn. And then it relates to the principle to the man of God. You know, a man of God, the preacher, those who serve God, those who do right, who want to do what God wants them to do in the New Testament is considered as an ox.
It says the principle to the man of God who brings forth the word of God says the laborer is worthy of his reward. It would be mean to make an ox labor hard to tread out the corn and then not let him eat the food. The Bible uses that as an illustration to show that it would not be right to have a man of God, your preacher, to labor for the Lord and then not be supported of his work that he does. And how many preachers are out there who are in a church who are laboring for the Lord and they're not paid? What we can't afford him. Said here he's worthy a double portion. Yeah, but how many cars do you have in your garage? How many boats do you have? How much money do you spend on the pet? How much money do you spend on entertainment? Where's your money go? And but that you starve the preacher out. Right? 1 Corinthians 9, 1 through 14. And I'll leave you to read that. But in 9, 1 through 14, Paul explained that he and Barnabas willingly chose to also work other jobs. Paul was a tent maker. Other than preaching and teaching. So in other words, Paul and Barnabas did take on extra work to not be a burden. But he makes it clear that they had the right to live off the offerings of the church if they so chose. In other words, Paul said, listen, I'm not going to work. You're to pay me. You're to support me. Paul would have all right. But Paul chose to work and help the newborn churches. He then referred back to the Old Testament again about ox that labors and states for the reason of the law, verses 6 through 10, or I only and Barnabas have not we the power to forbear working. 1 Corinthians 9, 6 through 10. We have the power not to work, but to labor in the word. Who goeth a warfare at any time at his own charges? <clears throat> what president or king gives money out of his own pocket to go to battle? Who plants a vineyard and eateth not the fruit thereof? Have you ever printed? Uh, printed. Have you ever planted a, a a garden in your yard and never ate of the fruit thereof? That's silly. Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not the milk of the flock? David took care of sheep. Do you think David never had uh, sheep's milk, sheep's meat? you think he never was uh, comforted with the, with the wool of the sheep? I say he would have. Say I these things as a man, or say as not the law, the same also, for it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Does God take care for oxen? Yes, God does. Or saith he altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope. Let's talk about a man of God doing the work. Like an ox. An oxen was used to plow. And that he that threshes in hope should be partaker of his hope. The plow is when you dig up the dirt. The threshing is when you beat out the seed to get ready to husk. Listen, from the plowing the dirt to the threshing of, of the, the fruits, the people that work are worthy of their, of their labor. Your pastor, no matter what you think, is a hard working individual if he's truly of the man of God. He doesn't just show up Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. He does a lot during the week. 
The Bible goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 9, 13, and 14, there's much to be said about offerings and tithings and paying the preacher and support in the ministry in the church age. I will read it again. Tithes were practiced before the Old Testament law. Tithes were commanded under the Old Testament law. Tithes are expected during the church age. Expected. Let me ask you. Friday, you go to work. What do you expect? What about your preacher? 1 Corinthians 9, 13 and 14. Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? Now let's talk about the Old Testament, the tabernacle and the temple service. When you they brought the offerings, when they brought the meat, they brought the, the wheat, they brought the new wine. Everything they brought, the oil, was given to the priests and they lived off that. They didn't have jobs outside. Even so has the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. That means their occupation, their living is to be based upon the service of God by you, the member of the church. The context is that the priests of the Old Testament were supported off the tithes brought to the Lord at the temple and the temple, or the tabernacle and the temple. They were commanded under the Old Testament law to bring their tithes so the priests could have a living. They could eat. They could live. It is expected in the church age to support the preacher, the man of God. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. The time that the tithes and offerings are to be brought in the church is made clear in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the church of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, What's the first day of week? It's Sunday. Let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him, that there be no gathering when I come. So on Sunday you are to bring your offerings according to Scripture, according to Paul, as God has prospered. Well, you say, well, I get paid every other week. I didn't get a paycheck that Friday. Then you, you don't bring nothing Sunday. God didn't give you nothing throughout the week. You didn't get $10 or $20 from Grandma in a, in a birthday or Christmas card. You didn't find $5 on the ground. You didn't get a rebate check from your uh, Black & Decker drill. Am I, am I hitting hard here? We did read a law. You know, the seeds were also to be part of tithe. Any income that you get is to be part of the tithe. Not just the labor your job. Every time I get a check or I get some kind of money from whatever it is, I've tithed that. And then some. It's none of your business how much more I give. The first day of the week is... Sunday. This would be the natural time to collect the tithes. See, and that is when the church would begin their meetings for the week. According to the above scriptures, tithing was practiced in the New Testament, just like it was in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, tithes supported the priest. In the New Testament, the tithes were to support those who labor in the word, the pastors. Let's go over this again. The tithes were practiced before the Old Testament law. They were put into order. They were put into the beat. They were done and due. 
Tithes were commanded under the Old Testament law. Thou shalt bring. Tithes are expected during the church age. Your pastor expects to be paid and should be paid. Why should he live on nothing while you live high on the hog? Second Corinthians nine seven. Now, attitude. Second Corinthians nine seven. Attitude and motive. Tithings and offerings are expected for a willing heart. Second Corinthians nine seven should be printed on every envelope for tithings and offerings. Because if you don't follow 2 Corinthians 9 7, now here you go, I'm, I'm going to give you a hallway pass. Don't give. Oh, yeah, look at that smile. It's the middle of the night, but I just saw the sunlight. The sun is shining in my heart. 2 Corinthians 9 7. Every man, according as he purposed in his heart, motive, so let him give, not grudgingly. Well, I have to give this money. I don't. I can use this money get a cup of coffee. Oh man, why I gotta write this check? Oh, this guy. Oh, he ain't do nothing for this money. And all they do is they just fully waste it on, on the, you know, the whatever they just wait. I don't know what they do with that. Here you go, take it. Not grudgingly. Or not of necessity. We got one more week for you to give an offering. One more week. Let's keep on doing. It. Let's aim for the thermometer. Let's get it. Let's go. Ra 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 ra. Bring your offering. We're gonna do one more week now because we didn't have enough last week. So one more week. Come on, bring it. Bring your money. You must. You must put money in the plate every single time. Ra 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 ra. That's necessary. For God loveth a cheerful giver. God will only account an offering if you give it cheerfully and not. Or, come on, let's do it. You can do it. Come on. God don't, God don't acknowledge those two, but he knows that you give it for a blessing to God, what God has blessed you. When you realize that God lets you keep 90%, and all he asks is 10%. Wow, Lord, I should give you more. And God uses for your honor and glory that I give. And thank you, Lord, I can sit in an air conditioner or a heated church and have rights. And a man that preaches the word correctly. I should be giving. I should be giving more, Lord. I'm not giving enough. Whether well, a person is given his tithe or an offering above the tithe, God wants his people to give with a pure, willing heart. Um, I was gonna, I'm going to stick with the outline. Well, let me just make a little note here. Tithe is 10%. Above the tithe is an offering. Don't you dare say you offer to God when you don't tithe. If you make $500 and you say, okay, here's my $5 to tithing, and then I give $2 for missionaries, you haven't offered nothing. You are still lacking. Because $500 a tithe would be $50. And anything over $50 would be an offering. That's a side note. Genesis 4, 3 through, 3 through 7. Genesis 4, 3 through 7. I take that you will read that on your own. I'm going to trust you with some things here. we got much to talk about in very little time. Genesis 4, 3 through 7. We see some offerings brought unto the Lord. Cain brought the fruit of the ground. Turnips. Beans. Cucumbers, stuff like that. 
An offering unto the Lord, verse 3. Genesis 4, 3. Abel brought the firstlings of his flock, verse 4, an animal. The Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect, verses 4 and 5. Why did God have respect unto Abel's offering, but not unto Cain's? God's a meaning. One reason is Abel's offering contained blood animals but Cain's did not Cain's was a bloodless sacrifice and you know let me add another side note here that there are some Bibles where they take the blood out they have removed the bloodless of Jesus Christ in their in their Bible and that your Bible may be anemic you're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ are you washed in the blood of the lamb Hebrews 9.22 Hebrews 9.22 says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. If you're saved by water baptism, you have no remission of sins because water can't save you. If you are are you if you are washed or trusting in a salvation of works, works is not blood. Psalms forty nine verses six through eight. Psalms forty nine verses six through eight. You need a blood sacrifice. You need a sinless blood sacrifice. He said, "What's this have to do with tithing? What's this have to do with giving?" has very much to do with tithing and giving. They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can be any means redeemed. Let me try it again. None of the none of them can be none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious. And it ceases forever. And that verse is that that chapter is saying right there is you can't buy salvation for you or for anybody. I can't give God a ten dollar bill and say, okay, get me through heaven. I can't give God twenty dollars for you. In Acts eight twenty, but Peter said unto him, Thy money perisheth with thee. Because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Someone offered Peter and said, listen, let me buy that power of the Holy Spirit. And Peter says, no. Wrong. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. The one that was in Acts 8. He says in chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things. As silver and gold. Go back to Psalms 49, 6 through 8, and Acts 20, 8, 20. For, oh, excuse me, from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, the sinless blood of Jesus. Besides having a clean heart, we also need to have a willing heart when we give to the Lord. You've got to be clean. You've got to be sinless. You've got to be under the blood, 1 John 1, 9. And you've got to give cheerfully. You've got to give willingly. Oh, I'm sorry. God does not account it to you. It will be a loss at the judgment seat of Christ if it's given grudgingly, if it's given of necessary. It will be a loss. It will be wood, hay, or stubble. Not gold, silver, precious stones. I'm sorry. When God wanted the tabernacle made, he told Moses, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they may bring me an offering of every man that, is, every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, Shall he take my offering? That's in Exodus 25 too. God says, listen, before you build that tabernacle, 
Everything going to give, and I want it willingly. If you want to keep the gold, you don't want to give it to God, don't give it. If you want to keep it, don't give it. But you will not be credited. You will not be given account. You will not be happy. You will not get a reward in the judgment seat of Christ. Exodus 35, 5. Exodus 35, 5. Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord, whosoever is of a willingly heart. Willingly heart. Heart is motive. That's not that, you know, I love you. It's what's your motive? You really want to give to God. You want to do it for God's purpose. You want God to bless. You want God to do something. In the same chapter, Exodus 35, verses 21 and 22, And they came every one whose heart stirred him up, and every one whom his spirit made willing, and they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation, and for all his service, and for the holy garments. And they came both man or men and women, as many as were willing, hearted, and brought bracelets and earrings and rings and tablets, all jewels of gold, and every man that offered, offered an offering of gold unto the Lord. They came because they wanted to come. Moses did not press them. Moses did not put them under a burden. Moses did not whip them. They came and said, this is ours, and now it's God's. God never forces anyone to get saved. It is a choice of the will. God wants people to come to him and be saved because they want to. Because they love him for first loving us. And 1 John 4.19 says we love him because he first loved us. We are to give lovingly. We are to give cheerfully. We are to give willingly. We are to give because God gave to us. In the same way God desires the people to give his work from a willing heart. Not be grieved or not be stingy. And the biggest problem question you run into, do I give by net or do I give by gross? That's already a stingy heart. You shouldn't have to ask. 1 John 5, 3 states, for, th for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Is giving money to God grievous to you? Do you not like giving God your time, your money, your effort? If it's grievous, it's a sin. To them that know to do good and doeth it not, it is sin, James says. You have sinned. First John 1 John 1.9, you need to get right. You need to confess it. You need to get your heart right, cheerfully and willingly. Matthew 6.19 Lay not up yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through to steal. Listen, you can put all your treasures in the bank. You can put all your treasures in a safe deposit box. You can put all your treasures in a lock box at home. You Wherever. Listen, thieves will come in. Rust will come in. You'll die and you won't be able to take it with you. It should be not hard for a Christian to tithe or to give something or to offer unto the Lord. It shouldn't be grievous. It should be a blessing. And our record in heaven should show that we did it with a willing, lovely heart. The next verse in Matthew 6, 19 says, But lay up yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust nor, nor rust does corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Do you realize when you do give, 
when you put it in the plate, when you write that check, that God is recording it in a heavenly bank account? Have you read Numbers? Have you read Chronicles on how much God has spent time with names and numbers and, and tallies and poles and, and the tabernacle and David given to Solomon? It records all the gold. It records all the brass. God is a bookkeeper. God will reward you. Now let me say that reward before we go any further. God may not give you $5,000 here on earth. There is no promise you give 10, you get 10,000. That's a lie from hell. But God will reward you in eternity by crowns, by silver, by gold, by precious stones at the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 21 brings it all down to home. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. When it comes to right down to it, people find a way to get money and to spend it on what they really want to spend it on. If you want, if you want to cut something, because something, you know, you really want something. Where do you get the money from in, in your checking account? Do you take it out of this? Do you take it out of that? Or do you take it out of God? Well, I'll cut from the time, the offering this week so I can go buy myself, you know, lunch this week. All the time that God suffers. There may be something that comes to mind right now. That you have been waiting for for a long time. But does the Lord have any place in your financial future? Do you desire to have financial part in his work? That will bring eternal rewards. Matthew 6.20 tells us to lay up treasures in heaven. Well how can we do that? Do you support God's work? More than you support man's work. Do you give more money for the stock exchange, United Way, and all those other men, manly, worldly things, rather than the true work of God? One way is giving to help missionaries. Now I must state before I even read, as you turn to Philippians 4.15, when you give to a church, you give to a pastor, you give to a missionary, you give to evangelists, make sure that that guy is doing correct. Make sure that guy is in the King James Bible. Make sure that guy is obeying the King James Bible. Make sure that guy is approved of God. Make sure that guy is worthy of your money. Because there are preachers, there are missionaries, there are evangelists out there. If you read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, they are doing the work of Satan and don't deserve your money. Make sure their money is going out to, to preserve and to take the gospel and to get the gospel out. To go in all the world and preach the gospel. And it's not being bought for stupid things. Read their prayer letters. Check them out. You'll see, you pray, and if you're in the will of God and your heart's right, you will know if that missionary's right. You will know if that evangelist is right. When their prayer letters sound like baby talk, babyish stuff, worldliness, don't support them. Philippians 4.15 Now ye Philippians, know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving but ye only. Only one church gave to Paul's missionary trip. Of all the churches, the Philippians gave money to Paul. They supported the missionary Paul. Notice the missionaries were supported through the local church. Verse 16. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necess necess necessity. 
And Paul used the money for what he needed, what was a necessary thing in his life. He didn't use it foolishly. The heaven rewards for that are seen in verse 17. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. The Philippians given money for Paul to do the work. God is recording. God is writing down. God is a interest. A lot better what the banks will give you interest. And in that what money you give for the help of a missionary, God will give an account to you with greater riches. And he might bless you here on the heaven. I mean the earth. He may give you blessings on the earth. But to see the eternal rewards in heaven at the judgment seat of Christ by the form of crowns be worth it all. Some people will say, but I do not have much money. It does not take a lot of money to gain a large account in heaven. It simply takes a loving, willing, giving heart. Listen, if all you got is after your tithe, after you paid your bills, brought your groceries, if all you got is 10 cents, I mean, that's all you got. And you say, Lord, this is not much, but I'm giving it to you because it, it's from me. It's my heart to bless a missionary. Lord, it's not much. You throw, you know, God take that 10 cents and use it much more and bless you for it. In tw Mark 12, 41, Jesus sat over against the treasury. And behold, how the people cast money in the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much. And, you know, thrown in what, you know, abundance. The next verse says, And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing, which is not much. Jesus then said in verse 43, and he called unto him his disciples and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow has cast more in than all they which had cast into the treasury. Now let me, let me bring it to American standard. This woman throws $5 in the plate. These other people, they're throwing hundreds, they're throwing fifties, they're throwing tens, they're throwing $1 bills. But they have a lot more money than that. They go out eating in very high places. They, they buy junk. They entertain themselves. And this woman gave all that she had to the Lord. And look what the Lord Jesus said in verse 43 about her. And sometimes, you know what? It may even take a sacrifice. Maybe giving up lunch at McDonald's or Burger King one during the, during the week. Say, you know what? I'm not going to go out to eat one day at Burger King or McDonald's or wherever you go and say, I'm going to have a bag lunch. And what I spend on that day, I'm going to put in the offering plate for the Lord. The Lord will you watch the Lord reward you and wait till you get to heaven to be rewarded even more by sacrificing a hamburger. Isn't that what a lot of these other places say? For a cup of coffee, you can do. And a lot of those worldly places are not acknowledged by God. And there are no heavenly treasures. And another thing you need to realize, you just can't throw your money to anybody and everybody. And we'll get on with that later on. He tells us in verse 44, For all they that did cast in of their abundance, it was just left over, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. Part of our worship to the Lord is bringing in an offering to him. An offering, again, is after the tithe. After that 10%, and anything after that is an offering. That woman did not have to give all her living. That's what Jesus is saying. I don't know what a farthing, uh, well, two mites. 
Well, ten wouldn't it wouldn't be one month. A farthing. She would she would have to give a tenth of a farthing. She gave the entire farthing. So whatever a tenth farthing is, that's what was required of her. Everything over that to make the farthing, God said, listen, that's an offering. She sacrificed a grocery. She sacrificed a bill, whatever. And she came out empty on the earth, but oh, in heaven, Jesus recognized it. Deuteronomy 16, 16, and 17. Three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God, in the place which he shall choose, which is Jerusalem, in the feast of unleavened bread, and in the feast of weeks, and in the feast of tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty. Now this is under the law. God says three times a year you better not be empty. Remember the law? It was commanded, but in the church age, it's expected. Expected means it, it, it's, it's looking forward to, but you may not have. In the law, you had to. A must. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessings of the Lord thy God, which he has given thee. This woman followed Deuteronomy 16, 17. She gave all, not just able, but all. That's a hard thing to do. I have never practiced that. I have never given God all my check. Isn't that something? Churches are sometimes accused of being greedy because they take up an offering every service. All they do is take up offerings. To be scriptural, churches should give people the opportunity to give every time they meet or is a part of the worship of the Lord. The example given is that people who people were never to appear before the Lord empty. There is no set amount that people must give. We have already covered the matter on tithing, which God does command. 10%, anything over, is an offering. People were just to give with a willing heart and to give as they were able. Are we under tithes? You're to give what you're able to give in the church. That's what scripture says. But what you give, you give willingly. And you give lovingly. And you're giving that you want God to bless it. Are you tithing faithfully to a good Bible-believing local church? You ever have to ask? No. I won't go there. God's work would never suffer lack if God's people would truly tithe from all of their income. All of the income. Income doesn't, doesn't just mean money. It could be from the garden. It could be time. God gives you a set amount of hours every week, doesn't you? Isn't that income? On the other hand, are you a member of a liberal church that does not preach the gospel and truth and preaches false doctrine? Are you tithing to it? Then by being a member there and tithing to that church, you are supporting false doctrine by your tithes and your offering. You are supporting Satan and his work if you are in a church. Now let me give you a little advice here. If there is no true Bible-believing church, and that church supports work that is not right and not Christian-like, when you give that offering, say, Lord, use this for your honor and glory only. And let it not be accounted to anything worldly or useless that you cannot give me a reward in heaven. Should I pray that prayer? Be a member of a good Bible-believing church and faithfully support it with your tithes and offerings. And we close with tithes, offerings, and alms. It's a very important issue. 
And we'll continue next week, Lord willing. I know you just love this subject. You'll learn more.